So malware C2 or X509 search exchange. So that's a lot of things to say. I'm basically talking about data infill, exfill over a certificate as opposed to HTTP traffic. So an HTTP request, the search been exchanged, but no HTTP request has actually been made. And you can transmit protocol over X509 because of extensions. A little bit about me. Uh, I used to work at Jack Henry a number of years ago. I now work at Fidelis Cybersecurity in uh, DC. Primarily focuses uh, reverse engineering and development around like automation frameworks. Uh, my primary focus is data structures and algorithms. Not really my primary focus, but more like my interest, I guess you could say. Uh, I used to run Dire Tracker back when Dire was still a thing. And there's my Twitter handle and my email. So for my email, this is going to be a pretty quick conversation, pretty quick presentation. Uh, the code piece, I'm going to kind of fly through. I'll show some highlights. If you want the code, email me, and I'll send you the whole code. I'm not going to post it on GitHub because I've never seen this used in malware, and I don't really want to <laughs> post it out there. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So primarily the reason that I created this presentation was to highlight the fact that cybersecurity is mostly proact or mostly reactive as opposed to proactive. And that's just because we primarily deal with defense, right? Um, that's changed a lot over the years. So the recent shift being exploit developers, pen testers, red teaming, I think is what most people call it, uh, has really kind of played a bigger part over the years. And I consider that more proactive. Uh, reactive is, I think, primarily because most of the people that come into cybersecurity come from IR forensics type backgrounds. And they always deal with stuff after it happens kind of the nature of the beast. Uh, so I'm a malware researcher. I also have exploitation experience. So I relate the fact that I saw this happen due to my exploitation experience. I don't write exploits. I'm not really very good at it. I primarily focus with malware. But just the fact that I've cross-trained has helped my mind kind of see those holes and those potential gaps and then kind of uh, create these situations. So the, the story of how this happened, I was primarily looking at Vautrac. Vautrac has a DGA. When they added the DGA and the HTTPS, HTTPS traffic, they started looking at a specific uh, extension in the cert. And what they were doing was they were taking the data and they were encoding it. And I thought that they were passing data over the cert. Turns out I was wrong. They were just checking a hash. They were just making sure that that hash was related to their, their real C2. Um, but it got me interested in what this extension meant. It's a subject key identifier. So I went to the, I Googled it, went to the uh, specifications and read what it said, which you can read here. The, if you have any exploitation experience reading stuff like this, you, you pick up on some buzzwords, right? Like um, this is a string extension that can take two possible values. The, the end sentence, the use of this hex string is strongly discouraged. They don't have any guidelines for how big or small it should be. You can put whatever you want in there. It, uh, it's supposed to be a hash, but it doesn't have to be a hash length. There's all these things that they, that they don't specify in their specifications, and it, it leaves you open to this kind of exploitation mindset of how you can use it for something other than its intended purpose, which I go over here. So we have a field that can hold arbitrary information stored into it, things that came to mind, exploitation, data exfil, data infill, uh, since I deal with my malware, that's malware C2. So for a proof of concept, which is what I went to next, I wanted to automatically create search that could hold this arbitrary data. I wanted to create a server that I could then talk to with a bot. And I wanted to uh, have the bot code, right, the code to retrieve the data. But I, I put this specification that I didn't want it to actually perform an HTTP request. So it does a head request. And then we'll get into why it doesn't do the head request. Cert generation is pretty easy. This is straight out of Google, uh, how to generate a cert or a, a key, right? So it's three commands. It's nothing really fancy. This is a Python script I wrote up. Uh, it, it pretty much just 
takes your cert and I have like a pass right of stupid and a config.txt. The config.txt is what I consider my banker config for my fake bot. And this Python script can run at any time, take the, the script or take the config, encode it, stick it in this extensions CNF file there at the bottom, and then it uh, generates a cert. It's kind of hard to see, isn't it? Anyway, so it generates the cert using the extensions and it does it in real time. So I can't use that cert in something like Apache because it loads it in memory. You have to have the key. I can't change it in memory. I would have to create like a module in Apache to bypass their security. Um, so instead, I'm gonna skip actually. So instead I created a server. It's just a Python server, waits for incoming connections over whatever port I specify and serves up the cert from disk. So the last line of my previous script is a open, open SSL RSA. I'm basically stripping the password off of the key. That way my Python script can use the key with the cert in real time from disk. And I don't have to uh, load it in memory with Apache or something like that. For retrieving the data, it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. If you've ever looked at like uh, anything off, most of this code came from MSDN with the exception of the callback. Um, but this is pretty much just making a head request. So it's making an HTTP head request. Uh, so the magic happens with the callback and I had to do some some really deep kind of finding of this specific callback because I had never seen it before. Maybe if you're a developer, you've, you've heard of it before. Basically this callback function, when you set it up, when you make a request, it sits there and you can tell it to wait for a specific status of the request. So the HTTP request is gonna go out. You're gonna do a cert exchange. All these different steps uh, are laid out in MSDN. This one is not, from what I can tell, it's internet status sending request. Basically this status happens after the cert exchange, but before the HTTP head request is actually sent. So at that point, I have access to the certificate. So you see at the bottom there, I uh, parse out the subject key identifier. I decode it uh, using, I think, XOR. I don't have that on here. And then I, I, I print to screen. So we'll, we'll uh, We'll show here. So this is a bot kind of in debug mode. I've told it to connect to my Python server. And then I, I've set up all these things to, to kind of print out all the statuses, right? So internet open success, HTTP open success, internet set option, uh, and then all the subject parameters. And then you see there the PV data at the bottom is the data from the subject key identifier field. And then I decode it and print it out. And it's basically kind of like a Baker Trojan config. Right, I'm telling it to uh, steal from Gmail, Yahoo, Amazon, doing whatever, form grabbing, cookie theft, whatever. And then I'm telling it to web inject Gmail with a, a div around stupid. So very kind of demonstration purposes. So here's the traffic. All you see is TLS. You don't see an HTTP request actually go out. So you got Wireshark at the top, Fiddler at the, front, at the bottom. And all, you see the connect and Fiddler but you don't, you don't actually see any HTTP request. So how did it detect this, right? So when I saw this and I thought of it, I created the POC and I went to our developers and was like, to make sure we could detect it. But how do you actually detect this? You either have to parse out all the data inside X509, which there's a lot, and potentially, as we'll see in the next slide, kind of, an arbitrary amount, unless you hard code set it. You have, uh, so you can detect it, that either the, the IP is malicious or you're pulling out data from the X509 certificate and you're saying that the subject key identifier in the specs says it should be a hash. So you can check the length and say, this isn't a hash length. Um, but then there's, you know, you start thinking of ways to get around that. Well, then I can just have my bot talk to me until it hits an end marker. So I can just keep sending hash length data segments back. These are some kind of interesting things I observed when I was going through. Um, so the open SSL version I had, which is 0.9.8 ZH on my Mac, uh, I didn't see a limit on how big I could make an extension. So I made one pretty like crazy long and uh, I loaded it up with Apache. So another interesting thing, Apache will gladly load a ginormous certificate and serve it back to you OpenSSL will then connect to that Apache server and attempt to parse it in memory and crash, 
because it runs out of memory. Um, Microsoft 10 64 bit on my VM actually doesn't, I don't know if it reads all of it, so I didn't deep dive. You'd have to go pretty deep to figure out exactly what it's doing, but it, um, it doesn't, it didn't, I didn't have access to all the data. It had a hard limit on what it gave me. So it probably has a limit on what it is expecting to see from an extension. And I think that was it. Yeah, that was it. Any questions? I'll put my, um, like I said, if you want the proof of concept code, you can email me and I'll send it to you. So, if you weren't generating uh, certificates yourself, if you were using something like Let's Encrypt or even you know, other certificates, can you uh, state that data like you're talking about? Do you get to choose what that is? If I'm doing like a Let's Encrypt certificate or ordering something from Network Solutions? I think you'd have to tell them. Okay, well, that's what I'm asking. Uh, it, for when you generate it, it has to be when you generate it. Okay. Now, I don't know exactly how the certificate. Authority okay. stuff works. Okay. So I know if you have a CSR, you can generate a certificate. Mm -hmm. So if Let's Encrypt gives you the CSR, you can probably generate it. But I don't think they do that. I think they just generate Because you always have to, for Let's Encrypt, you always have to, to update it, right? So you always have to, you always get a certificate from them, yeah. Okay. So forgive my ignorance on this. Uh, as far as the data structure of, some of the extensions, like, you know, Microsoft Office 365, what Mm -hmm. Are are you going? To, can you modify the same cert over and over again and send that out and the protocol still accept it? Or are you going to have to generate a new cert every time you do this because of other fields in the cert? Depends on how you're doing it. So for exfil purposes, and I didn't really touch on it much. I just kind of mentioned it because I was trying to create a proof of concept for it. If you pivoted in a local network to your HTTP server, which is what I would do as an attacker and then tried to overwrite your cert to send data. So we're talking about like, um, what was the thing that happened not too long ago? They had like image files in the, the web server and then the, they were infected. And so the bad guys were like hitting web servers for the text pool. If you did something similar to that with your HTTP server, it's gonna exist in memory. Um, so you would have to find that in memory and edit it, I think. <laughs> and I, that may be possible if you always use the exact same amount of data but then how do you control I guess you'd only have so much data blob you can exfil um, you could use it if you, yeah Yeah. That was my thinking is that it would be noticed because of the impact of the performance impact on the itself. Um, yeah. Prim I'm curious, this is, a, this is interesting. I haven't seen someone do that service. I haven't seen anybody do it. Um, and the, from my, like I said, my primary focus was the fact that, and I thought that if your defense product or your security product was looking at URLs, the only way to block that would be to parse the data and see that it's anomalous or detect it by IP. Since there's no HTTP request, you can't really do anything. Um, but would that be a, a stupid question? Would that be a signature? Because the normal HTTP is going to be get, post, head. So if there's nothing there, that would to me be a signature. Maybe if you're man in the middleing everything. Like what do you, if you're not man in the middleing your network, what do you see? I know most corporations are going to man in the middle of it. Oh, yeah, yeah. From the endpoint. So everything changes in the endpoint. Endpoint's where a lot of the good stuff comes. But more and more sites are going as to the mm -hmm. So if you're man in the milling it, yeah, you'd see the TLS kickoff, and you wouldn't see an HTTP request. So is that bad, though? Always. I don't think it's always bad. What if I go to HTTPS Google.com and 
I just don't get a good resolution or they're updating the website and I just click the tab close or something. Like at what point does the request actually go through and not go through? I think you'd get some false positives there probably. Yeah, for exfil purposes, it's kind of odd. So you could use it if a malicious guy. Uh, so if you had internal stuff set up and you were looking for bots talking to other bots internally, which not a lot of people do, there's some security you could get around with by, by doing that. It, like from one bot to the other bot as well. The situation that that would arise, though, that would be a pretty advanced actor and very specific to your network. They've already been there for a while. Any other questions? All right.